Hello and welcome to this review of my Razer Huntsman Tournament Edition keyboard. This was a commercial donation from Razer, thanks guys. I'd already asked someone else in the company for a Huntsman almost a year ago, and at first they were very keen to send me one before instantly cutting off all communication, maybe at this point they found out what I had to say about the Ornata keyboard, but it made no sense to me because this sounded like an excellent keyboard to redeem themselves with. And so, someone alerted me to a review unit giveaway, and now I can finally show you one. Which is good, because this is easily one of the most requested keyboards in the history of this channel. I did an unboxing of this a while ago, and I've been testing it, and it's quite an interesting specimen. It's part of a wave of new high-tech keyboards that comprise an alternative to the more traditional Cherry MX and the Rilk. It's a so-called contactless keyboard, named for the fact that the switches don't need to brush against metal contacts to register a keystroke, which in turn increases the smoothness of the switches. To be clear on some terms here, smoothness is the opposite of scratchiness, which is an unpleasant, rough, raspy feel that's at least to a degree inherent to contact-based switches such as Cherry MX. This is the linear version, there is also a clicky one. Not only that, it's essentially Razer's response to a bunch of community feedback. Basically, they just went on Reddit and asked, so what do you guys really want in a keyboard? And then they made it, which is mad props in my eyes. I wish more companies would do that. And it's worked too, because this is a lot better than their previous keyboards that I've reviewed. Not too long ago, I talked about what's arguably the closest competitor to this keyboard, the SteelSeries Apex Pro, which I'll be comparing it to during the course of this review. This is also a contactless keyboard, although it's based on Hall Effect switches, while the Razer is an optoelectric keyboard. Optoelectric switches rely on an extraordinarily simple principle. They consist of a slider which blocks the path of an infrared beam. As soon as the slider is pressed, the blocking part moves out of the way and the beam is allowed to reach a photoresistor which detects the keystroke. It's an extremely reliable design that should last for hundreds of millions of key presses, or more accurately, considering the limiting component should be the lifetime of either the infrared LEDs or photoresistors, tens of thousands of hours. Note that the switches don't hold any of the sensing assembly, they're essentially just clip-in holding modules for the slider and spring. The LEDs and photoresistors are all held PCB side. Neither Hall Effect keyboards nor optoelectric ones are a new concept. Hall Effect keyboards were being made as early as the late 1960s by Microswitch, and the earliest optoelectric keyboard I know of was made by Burroughs in the early 80s. But both designs were revived more recently, the Hall Effect switch by Ace Power Tech and the optoelectric switch by Bloody. A while ago, I also reviewed a Wooting keyboard, which was the first to use optoelectric switches to produce in-game analog effects. And and who are at the moment developing a Hall Effect keyboard as well. It's truly a great time for keyboards. Razer was very tight-lipped about whom provided the switches, but really they're essentially just rebrands of Bloody's Lightstrike Libra, which were third-partied by a company specialized in optical switches called Dongguan Mingjun Electronic Company, which I'll just abbreviate to DMET. They call the switches simply MJ3.0, and they also make the clicky version, as well as Bloody's previous generation of optical switches, Lightstrike Optic 2. Small anecdote, I asked Bloody for a Libra keyboard, but they refused for what appears to be exactly the same reasons Razer originally did. After I told their marketing department such a large new asshole two and a half years ago over the B188 that I wouldn't be surprised if they were still butthurt. Anyway, the key feel is exceptionally smooth. It makes Cherry MX switches feel like sandpaper. There are many old Soviet keyboards around that prove that contactless doesn't inherently mean smooth, but this is contactlessness done properly. I can't detect any scratchiness for the life of me. It's absolutely delicious. Of course, being optoelectric, they're also very, very reliable, as there's nothing to really break. An interesting trait that these Libra switches have is that every single key comes with its own stabilizer. On most keyboards, stabilizers are reserved for larger keys and even then usually done keycap side, but in these it's built into the switches themselves. The purpose of this is to make the keys go down more smoothly when pressed off axis. 
on switches where too little attention has been paid to this aspect, a phenomenon known as binding can occur. This means that if you press the keys from an angle that's not straight down, you can feel a rough, scratchy and considerable stiffening of the switch. In some cases, like this Cherry MY keyboard, the winding is so bad that the switches <laughs> regularly get stuck in these positions until you apply considerable force, which is the, the loud knocking noise you're hearing. The razor, by contrast, doesn't have this at all. There's not even the faintest hint of binding, which is excellent because binding is the actual antichrist. It's still not completely clear to me why every single switch needs its own stabilizer. I suspect it's a bit overkill, but whatever, whether it's truly necessary or not, it works. It should be noted that binding isn't the same as wobble, which is when your keys can move sideways without pressing them down like this. It varies a lot per switch design, but being good at one doesn't mean you're also good at the other necessarily. For example, NMB Space Invaders are very stable, so they exhibit very little wobble, but when dirty, they're certainly not immune to binding, while Cherry MX wobbles far more, but is one of the most binding-resistant contact switches. It's probably the strongest aspect of the whole design, in my opinion. The Razor scores pretty good overall. It wobbles slightly more than MX switches, but the important thing is that it doesn't bind in the least, as in zero. And really, as long as the keyboard doesn't bind, I couldn't give a flying fuck about wobble, even if it did wobble a lot, which it doesn't. In my opinion, people tend to overemphasize the wobble aspect a bit. <laughs> But Thomas, if every key has its own stabilizer, wouldn't you be deafened by stabilizer rattle? Now, to clarify, many keyboards, I'd go as far as to say most actually, have stabilizers that make a loud rattling noise when you press it, like this spacebar on an OmniKey Ultra keyboard. It's usually caused by the stabilizing moving back and forth too liberally in its guardrails. This is not the case with the Razer at all though, and I really listened for it, but it's just not there. I'm not sure how they prevented this, because the stabilizers don't appear to be lubricated, which is normally an easy fix for stab rattle. There is a little bit of spring ping, and you can hear the stabilizers move back and forth if you shake the board horizontally. But when just typing on it, there's absolutely no hint of rattle at all. I think it's because the stabilizer slot is not very tall. It's barely tall enough for the wire to fit in, so it gets little to no opportunity to bounce around. I'm aware some people have reported rattle with this model, but maybe this is an updated version or something, because I can't hear a thing. The Razer and Steel series do have very different sounds. The Razer has a very clacky sound, which immediately struck me when I unboxed it, whereas the Steel series is a little bit more subdued and bassy. It's also a bit more powdery though. It depends a bit on what you want in keyboard sound. A notable improvement on the Steel series is the keycaps. Instead of the commonly used lasered ABS you find on most commercial keyboards, these are actually double shot PBT, which is a combination of the most durable material plus the most durable printing method, so thumbs up for sure. There is a drawback though, as you can see the lighting is very uneven through them, which is a common byproduct of making double shots that are backlight compatible. See, the lettering is kind of blotted all over. I think the thinness of the font isn't helping it in this regard either. The backlighting overall is actually not that great, it's neither very vivid nor bright, nor is the colour bundling all that well done. It's not terrible in any of these categories, but I've just seen better. This is actually an area where the Steel Series clearly beats it, as that keyboard has particularly vivid and bright RGB. Note this comparison between the two at identical camera conditions. At least the font is now somewhat normal, definitely a great improvement over the weird cyber crap you see on their old boards. I've been told it was their CEO specifically who wanted this new font, so thanks Mr. Tan. In fact, the whole board looks much better and less try-hard than the older models, which I've read as a conscious effort to move away from the quote-unquote edgy gamery look, and while I'm sure some people like this older styling better, I think this is a big improvement. Another feature that's an improvement is that it comes with a detachable braided cable rather than a fixed plastic one. It's quite nice, if a bit stiff, USB on one end and USB-C on the other. This is typically one of those community requested features, like the keycaps. 
The build quality is pretty comparable to the Steel series and not bad. It's a plastic case with anodized aluminium mounting plate. Weighing in at 690 grams, it's not exactly on the weighty side. And the plastic case is very thin, but it's decent enough otherwise. It is a nightmare to take apart though, and it looks like you need to break some kind of screw seal to open it, which has resulted in this permanent warp in my case, so be warned. The software it uses, Synapse, I've previously torn to pieces for being multi-shit bloatware, and it still is. They made some improvements to it, but the biggest improvement is that you can bypass it if you want to just toggle between a few preset lighting modes which you can access keyboard side rather than needing to use the software. For more complex patterns or programming macros, you still need it though, so remember that. Seriously, raise it. just let someone in the keyboard community with a lot of coding experience develop some new, decent software for you. Don't bother trying to keep this Synapse crap alive. It's quite a bit cheaper than the Steel series. It's not a cheap board at $150, one of the most expensive offerings in Razer's keyboard catalog, in fact, but the Steel series is half again as expensive at $230, and it only features special keys on the alphanumeric block, as decking out the whole thing would have made it even more expensive. So the Razer is considerably cheaper, and in reality, better kitted out, with double-shot PBT keycaps, a detachable cable, and the full deck of special switches. However, it lacks one feature in particular that the Steel Series has, and it's a big one. Analog capability. Optoelectric switches, like on the Razer, are fundamentally capable of analog output, although this isn't easy. Unmodified, the analog window of a basic optoelectric switch is absolutely tiny, and Wooting had to use a complicated set of optics in every switch in order to make the analog window on their adapted flare switches large enough to be usable. Moreover, analog capability also costs a lot of processing power, as your keyboard will need to be capable of registering infinitely more output possibilities than a simple on-off keyboard. In the Steel series, each switch can register at least 10 different levels of output, so the alphanumeric area alone could register about 60 to the power of 10 different output value combinations, which is an astronomically large number, so as you'd expect, analog capability significantly drives up the cost. Razer do actually do an analog optoelectric keyboard, their Tartarus Pro model, but that's still $130, almost as expensive as the whole Huntsman, and it only has 19 of these optoelectric analog switches. So, as you can see, it comes at a cost. Making the Huntsman analog capable would require more than just a firmware upgrade as well. You'd need a whole different PCB, possibly even different switch modules. Anyway, in a nutshell, the reason I like analog capability so much is that it allows you to set the actuation point of your switches. So if you want really hyperactive switches, you can stick them all the way at the top, and if you want to avoid mistypes more, you can stick them all the way at the bottom, or in my case, somewhere in between. The problem with the Razer is that while I really like the feeling of the switches, the actuation point is too high for me, considering the very light weighting of only 40 grams of force. The weighting profile is actually identical to that of Cherry MX Red, linear from 30 to 60 grams of force, but unlike MX Red, they actuate at as little as 1 mm rather than 2. And I get it, it allows them to stick those marketing slogans on that say they actuate twice as fast and are hyper responsive and turbo gamer and everything. And that's all great and stuff, but it makes them way too sensitive. An excellent example of overly aggressive marketing prevailing over common sense and ruining a great product. Because as a result, during gaming, the weight of my fingers is constantly setting off the keys. So I keep walking sideways when I'm not intending to and stuff like that. I swear I must have accidentally walked or jumped off of a cliff in Borderlands 3 a thousand times now, you know, that sort of thing. And before you ask, no, you can't just spring swap them with stiffer MX springs, because the springs it uses are very different. And fuck me, I tried to get this slider out of the switch, but it really doesn't want to let go. Besides, because the actuation point is so high up, you'd need a wastefully high weighting to make it stiff enough at the actuation point for it not to trigger accidentally. During typing, it's not really a problem because I don't rest my hands on the keys when typing, but during gaming it's very noticeable, I keep fucking stuff up, which is kind of ironic for a hardcore gaming keyboard. I should note that this is a very personal thing and will definitely not be true for everybody, it's just a case for me personally. It's borderline unusable for me unfortunately, which is a huge shame because the switches feel so nice.
With his Steel series, which has more or less the same light and actually very nice weighting, this was not a problem because its analog capability allowed me to just move down the actuation threshold to a point where I never accidentally press it nor miss any keystrokes. If there was ever a perfect example of the virtues of analog capability, it's this one. It makes all the difference for me in this case. Either way, it makes for a terrific typing keyboard for me, very pleasant and smooth, absolutely no complaints here. In this case, the personal caveat actually works the other way around, because I don't touch type, but if you do, you might get the same issue with the weight of your fingers setting them off. So, now for the dreaded smoothness test. Well, clearly it's a lot smoother than MX switches, no real contest there, but the real question is, how does it hold up against the Steel Series and the Wooting? Which of the three is the smoothest? Well, first of all, I should be clear, these three are collectively basically the smoothest keyboards I own, so even the last place is just about the best thing in the universe. In any case, the Razer is considerably smoother than the Wooting, and roughly on par with the Steel Series. It doesn't feel the same as the Steel Series, though. The Steel Series feels a little bit more buttery or lubricated, while this one feels a little bit more frictionless. I'd say they're both equally good, which is a fantastic achievement. Let me be perfectly clear, this keyboard is a huge step in the right direction for Razer, it's a legit product. You know, finally a Razer review that I don't have to get the swearing dictionary out for. With some tweaking, really just finding a good way to match actuation and weighting, it could be an excellent keyboard. But at the moment, I find it very difficult to use. So that's my big point of feedback to them. Don't go back to the MX bullshit, but stick with this and improve it. And ditch Synapse, nobody wants it. So that's the long and short of it really. The Razer is much cheaper, comes with much better keycaps, a better cable, and all the switches are contactless. While the Steel Series has much better backlighting, a little screen that you can doodle on, and most importantly, that analog capability. So it's really easy actually. I'd say if you don't need analog capability, get the Razer, and if you do want it, get the Steel Series. Or the Wooting actually, which is more niche, but also a very competitive choice with many of the advantages of both. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.